just had a minute to look at the whole title. Uh, it's a fairly long title. So, uh, so let me just spend the first maybe you know, minute or two just you know, say what I mean by this title. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, so I want to look at uh, uh, maximizing gains from trade in two-sided markets. Uh, and in the literature, there are essentially two lines of work, okay? uh, two types of guarantees. The first type, uh, I consider them as asymptotic efficient mechanisms in the sense that uh, these mechanisms will say, uh, look at the realized you know, uh, input. If the input satisfies some nice conditions, such as large market condition, uh, the performance is very good. In fact, if the size of the market grows, uh, the performance converges to optimal. Okay, so that's what I call asymptotic efficient mechanisms. Uh, the issue is, of course, what if this large market condition does not hold, and there's no guarantee whatsoever there? Right. So that's the first type of guarantee in the literature. The second type is a very traditional computer science, you know, worst case guarantee that just says, you know, no matter what the inputs are, you know, I'll get some fraction of uh, the performance. Um, but the issue here is, well, maybe your input is actually very nice. It's very easy. Maybe it actually satisfies the large market condition, and you're being very pessimistic and only getting a constant fraction without hitting, you know, maybe even the optimal. Okay. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to present one mechanism actually gives you both kind of guarantees. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, that's the first uh, for this talk. Okay. okay so, uh, so I think for this audience, I don't need to motivate like, you know, why two-sided market is a very important problem. So let me just you know, quickly go over the basics. Uh, um, so the very uh, uh, Basic setting is bilateral trade. You're, uh, you have one item to sell. There's one seller. There's one buyer. And the seller uh, has some private costs for parting with the item, which is drawn from distribution. Uh, there's one buyer who has some private value uh, for uh, getting the item, also draw from a distribution. And so the goal for this talk is I want to find a mechanism that maximizes efficiency. So in this particular case, uh, you should use an allocation that you know, trades whenever the buyer's value is higher than the, the cost. All right, uh, so more formally, I would like a mechanism that has the following uh, conditions. I want it to be IR, IC, uh, budget balance, meaning that the mechanism does not lose money by running. And also, I want to use this efficient trade allocation. All right, so that's uh, the basic case. And since we're trying to maximize efficiency, uh, the natural thing to do is, well, let's try to run VCG and see what happens in this case. OK, if you run VCG, uh, so we see uh, the trade happens. And the buyer is going to pay $9, because that's the critical value whenever the buyer reports higher than 9, trade happens. Okay. And similarly, uh, the seller needs to be compensated by, uh, by $10, because if the seller reports anything less than 10, the trade happens. Okay. So you can run VCG, but there's a deficit of 1. Okay. So VCG maximizes efficiency, but it's not budget balance. Okay. And it turns out uh, no mechanism can satisfy all these conditions. Um, there's a quite uh, similar result by Myers and uh, that's why they show that even in bilateral trade, you cannot have a single mechanism that is interim IR, Bayesian IC, weekly budget balance, and use this efficient trade allocation. OK, so a very strong uh, negative result. And uh, there has been a lot of work trying to uh, sort of uh, circumvent this negative result. And the approach is, let's try to approximate efficiency while maintaining the other properties. OK, so now I can be a bit more specific about these uh, two types of guarantees that exist in the literature. OK, so the first one, uh, I call the exposed asymptotic efficient mechanisms. Uh, by exposed, I mean that the guarantee is on every realization of the type profile. OK, so once you have drawn the type profile from the distribution, uh, this mechanism will look at the profile and see if it satisfies this large market condition. If it satisfies, it gives you good guarantee, in fact, you know, asymptotically efficient. Uh, if it does not satisfy, and then you know, there's no guarantee at all. Uh, in particular, uh, the trade reduction by McAfee is one of uh, satisfy this type of guarantee. Uh, and I'll explain that mechanism uh, in a minute. Uh, the second type of guarantee is just uh, 
worst case guarantee. Here I call it ex ante, uh, worst case approximation guarantee, meaning that I want a mechanism such that in expectation of the realization of the types, its performance is within some fraction of the optimal expected performance. Okay. That's a second type of guarantee. So a priori, it's not clear. You know, these are just incomparable guarantees. Right? And the way I would like to think about these two guarantees are, um, so the first basically saying, like, I will have a very optimistic mechanism that works extremely well if the input's easy. Okay. Uh, the second one is a more pessimistic type of guarantee that says, I'll have a mechanism that just works reasonably well on average. Okay. But maybe it's not doing so well, even the input's e easy. Um, and okay, so the plan is I will show you uh, a mechanism of each uh, that satisfies each type of guarantee. Uh, and also, I'll, I'll prove to you that you know, uh, these mechanisms, they do not satisfy the other type of guarantee. And I'll, I'll show you how you can actually come up with a new one that actually satisfies those. Questions? Okay, so before I describe this mechanism, so there's one more thing I want to talk about. So we're going to be, uh, we want to approximate efficiency. So there are two different ways to measure efficiency. One is just a traditional welfare concept. The other one is called a gains from trade. Uh, and in fact, you can just think about gains from trade as how much more uh, welfare you get by running the mechanism. So in this case, once the trade happens, the welfare goes from 9 to 10, so the gains from trade is 1. So if you want to maximize welfare, it's just the same as maximize gains from trade. But now we're talking about uh, approximation. The two concepts are actually quite different. If you approximate the welfare, it's very different from approximating gains from trade. And just look at this example. If I don't trade at all, it's a good approximation for welfare. But uh, it gives you zero gains from trade. Okay. So, uh, and the goal for this talk is I want to approximate gains from trade. Okay. It's a harder task, uh, but that's what we want to uh, compare to, okay? <clears throat> and you know, if you're happy with approximating welfare, there's a lot of nice results, works in quite general settings, but uh, that's not the focus of the talk. All right, so next I want to introduce you know, these two mechanisms, each with a different type of guarantee, okay? All right, so, um, so I'm gonna be talking about mechanisms that use uh, mark, large market assumption so clearly, I cannot be just talking about bilateral trade because I mean, you only have two agents. Okay? So, <laughs> so you have to have a, at least uh, a setting where you know, the, the size of the problem can grow. OK, so, uh, so I'm going to consider the first one is called uh, the double auction. So you have n buyers, n sellers. Uh, each seller has one item. Uh, the goods are all homogenous. OK, they're the same type of items. Uh, each seller has a private cost for the item, draw independently from uh, her own distribution. Every buyer has a private value. Okay. And when I say double auction, what I mean is every buyer can trade with every seller. Okay. That's the setting. And uh, here is uh, the trade reduction mechanism by McAfee. Okay, so what you do is the following. You take the, the profile. Okay, you sort them. You sort the buyer's bids uh, in the sending order. You sort the seller's bids in ascending order. Okay. Now, uh, you decide Q, which is efficient trade size, okay? The number of pairs you would trade in VCG, say. Okay. And in this case, Q will be three, right? And then what you do is you only trade the top Q minus one pairs. You only trade these two pairs. And then use the third pair to set the prices. Okay. So the winning buyers will pay BQ, which is 60. Sellers will receive 45. Okay. So that's the trade reduction mechanism. Okay. Very straightforward mechanism. And the guarantee that McAfee provided uh, was that the mechanism is exposed IR, exposed IC, exposed budget balance, and also gives you 1 minus 1 over Q fraction of the Realize gains from trade. So when I say realize, meaning that for, you know, with respect to this particular type profile. All right. Uh, I mean, the argument is very straightforward, right? So budget balance is because this is also a, you know, a possible efficient trade pair. So the, uh, the buyer value is higher than the seller cost. And uh, since I'm only dropping the worst uh, pair, I only lose one over Q. All right. 
So, uh, and you know, if Q goes to infinite, I clearly have something that's almost optimal. Uh, the issue is, well, I mean, there's no guarantee if Q is one, right? All right so it's something that does not give you a worst case guarantee. All right. So next, let me show you uh, a mechanism uh, that gives you some worst case guarantee. Okay, and I want to first even look at just bilateral trade. Okay. Yeah. You, you mean, you mean for, for the finite market? Sorry. For, for, there's, there's no guarantee for any finite market. It's not going to, I don't understand. You mean for Q it's finite? Oh. Yes, it's not getting to one, but if you grow the size of the market, it converges to one. That's what I mean by asymptotic efficiency. What? Like, why does Q converge to one? So sorry, one minus one over Q converges to one if I grow the size. So why does Q have to grow with the size of the market? It does not necessarily go with the market. So the size of the market is Q. So that's how I'm uh, defining it. The efficient trade size Q. Okay. Yeah. So if that grows, and of course, if you make some assumptions on the distribution, then you can say when the size of, you know, yeah. grows, then Q also grows. All right. Okay. Okay, so let me... Uh, uh, give you a uh, mechanism that gives you worst case uh, guarantee. Um, so even for bilateral trade. So if you want to compare to the first best gains from trade, that's just uh, the highest gains from trade you can get, uh, forgetting all the constraints like IR, IC, you know, budget balance. That's the first best gains from trade. If you want to compare to that, uh, we only have conditional results, uh, meaning that you have to make assumptions on the distributions. Okay, for example, you can get factor two approximation if the buyer's medium value is higher than the medium of the solid cost, or you know, uh, some tail condition on uh, one of the agent's distribution. Okay. Uh, even to now, we don't have a uh, worst case guarantee uh, compared to the first best uh, without making assumptions on the distribution. So, uh, so what people did is, uh, uh, and find myself, okay, so uh, you relax the benchmark. So instead of looking at the first best, let's look at the second best. Second best is uh, the highest gains in the trade you can get using a mechanism that's IR, IC, and budget balance. All right, so that's the second best benchmark. And you know, it turns out if you want the optimal second best, it's something quite complex, even in bilateral trade, if you go to double auction, it's something, it's a monster, so you don't want to look at that. Uh, so what we did is we'll look at uh, an approximation to the second best. So this is a result with uh, uh, my student and postdoc. Um, we show that you can have a quite simple mechanism that gives you half of the second best gains from trade. Okay, so let me uh, show you the mechanism. It's quite straightforward. So you just randomly run one of the following two mechanisms. So the first one I call seller offering. So what you do is the seller pulls the take or leave a price and the trade happens whenever a buyer accepts that price. Okay, and how does the seller decide the price? The seller looks at uh, his cost and the buyer's value distribution, figure out, figure out a price that maximizes uh, her expected utility. Okay, and you can do the buyer offering, which is just a symmetric version of the seller offering mechanism. So randomly pick one of the two. Uh, okay, so this gives you a factor two approximation. Okay, in the bilateral trade case. Okay, and you know the, you can generalize uh, the mechanism to uh, uh, scenarios where you have multiple agents. Uh, it works for double uh, auction. It also works for a more general case, uh, which I, which we call the matching market case. So the difference is now you have a bipartite graph that specifies who can trade with whom. Okay, and you know, the general setting, uh, the mechanism is called random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism. Uh, so I'll explain why uh, we gave the mechanism this name. So again, you do, uh, you pick one of the two following mechanisms randomly. So the first one, you, you can think about this mechanism as you're finding an allocation that maximizes the seller's total virtual surplus. So let me explain what it means. Okay, so you have a bipartite graph, right? So that specifies who can trade with whom. Now, uh, for every edge in the bipartite graph, I'm gonna assign a weight. Okay, what is this weight? So for an edge between buyer I and seller J, I'm gonna assign 
this weight. Here I have buyer's virtual value function. So if you're familiar with auction theory, this is exactly Meyerson's virtual value for this buyer uh, with respect to his distribution, minus the seller cost. Okay, so that's the weight on that edge. Okay, you assign all these uh, weights to the edges, find the max weight matching. Okay, that's the allocation. Okay, it's not hard to see, it's a monotone allocation. And in fact, you know, if you charge the critical values, you can prove it's also budget balance. All right. Um, so I won't go to that proof, but one thing uh, that might be, uh, might, might not be so clear is why is this the same as the solid offering mechanism I was talking about earlier in the bilateral trade case? So there, I'm not talking about anything about virtual values and so on. So, um, so here's why, okay? So if you only have one pair in the market, one buyer, one seller, now you're, you're the seller, you want to offer a price, okay? So uh, what is the allocation you should use? So a little thought review is that you should trade with the buyer whenever the buyer's virtual value is higher than your cost, right? Okay, so that's the allocation in the seller offering mechanism. And that turns out to be exactly the same as here. Here you would trade again as whenever the buyer's virtual value is higher than the seller cost. Okay. So the two mechanisms have the same allocation, and you know, uh, so you can use payment data to back up the, the prices, so they're equivalent. And you do you know, the symmetric version of the seller offering mechanism. Uh, randomly chose one of the two. Uh, you get a factor two approximation, uh, in the, even in the metric market. Okay. So this is a mechanism that gives the worst case guarantee. All right, so in expectation over the, the types, you get half of the optimal case and trade. Uh, but it turns out not to be asymptotic efficient. Yeah? Where, what's the worst case? So what's the worst case? The randomization between the two must have something to do with the... You mean what's the worst instance? So we don't have a distribution that shows two is tight. So, so in that sense, I don't know what's the worst case. Uh, but presumably, the guarantee has something to do with randomizing between the two. The randomization between the two mechanisms has something to do with how you get the guarantee. Oh, yes, right. So, uh, so basically, I'm, I'm relaxing the optimal gains from trade to some benchmark. I can use the sum of the two mechanisms gains from trade to cover that. So in particular, it will mean that you can just use one of the two, and you can still get factor two. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm randomizing because the two just, you know, this is easier to describe. Uh, yeah. could do max. I can do the max of the two. Yeah. Huh. yeah, I can do the max of the two. I don't have, okay, randomness is not necessary. Okay, you can just use it. I guess a related question, do you know that one of them may not work? Like if, if you use Yes, one? if you just use one, it would not work. You need to take the better of the two. Oh. Yeah, so there are instances when you only do one side, it's not gonna work. Do you have an intuition for why it doesn't work? Because from what I remember, the, the welfare approximation mechanisms only use the seller's distribution, right? They, are, they don't break that's, that's right, but no. So first, welfare approximation is very different because, yeah. right, like. It's the, curious if you have an intuition for right, why so you need it here, but not there. I'm not sure, I have examples. I'm not sure I, I, I have this due, you know, some, uh, very easy to communicate intuition out there. But you know, right, so but like welfare is very different because no trade very often is a good solution there and it's a very hard case for us. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay. Okay, so um, this is not asymptotic efficient, and here's one uh, very simple example. So consider a very large double auction with, uh, say, N buyers and N sellers. Consider M will you know, increase uh, to infinity. And each of this agent has value cost sample uniformly between zero and one. Okay. So clearly, the efficient trade size will be roughly N minus order root N, right, in this case. And you know, if you increase N, just run trade reduction, you will almost get first best. Right? You can get any fraction within first best. Okay, so now if you run, you know, the mechanism I just described, the random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism, uh, it does not converge to the first best. In fact, it misses at least even a constant fraction of the second best. Okay, and the reason is just because I'm using virtual value to decide what I'm trading 
and it's not really the value. Uh, virtual value, usually there's a gap between virtual value and value. So I'm missing a, a big trunk of the trades. Uh, so I won't go into you know, details, but uh, you can show that if the buyers have value between one half and two thirds, and the sellers have cost between one third and one half, like no trade will happen, even though it's actually beneficial to trade. Okay. Because the way the mechanism is set up, like no trade will happen. And that will just make you lose a constant fraction of the, the case trade. All right, so it's not asymptotic efficient. Uh, and so the goal is uh, I want one mechanism that has both guarantees. Okay, so it's ex post asymptotic efficient with respect to the first best. And it's ex ante uh, approximates the gains from trade. Uh, now I'm comparing to the second best. Yeah. How fragile, so if you did a little perturbation of, of um, incentive compatibility, so you wanted incentive compatibility to, be to an epsilon, would, would you suddenly get very close to the optimum? No, I think you would need epsilon to be some, you know, big constant. That's this, I mean, some constant is comparable to this fraction because the reason is, the trade here does not happen because you're looking at a virtual value, and that's the way to maximize the utility. So you want them to trade whenever buyer's value is higher than the seller cost. So basically, that's not a utility maximizing mechanism. So you basically have to have the epsilon in the IC so large that they're willing to change from the utility maximizing mechanism to a mechanism that always trades. So you will need the epsilon to be fairly big. It cannot be something that's a uh, Yeah, well, we can talk about that. <coughs> so I'll show you one mechanism that uh, achieves both. Uh, one thing I want to point out is uh, if we're in algorithm design, this is a trivial task. Right? If you have an algorithm, you have two algorithms. One is asymptotic efficient. The other one you know, gives you some worst case guarantee. Now I want an algorithm that gets best of both worlds. That's trivial, right? Take your instance, run both algorithms, take the better result. You're done, right? It's for algorithms, okay? In mechanism, turns out that's not okay. We have two mechanisms, and one is asymptotic efficient. The other one has worst case guarantee. You cannot just simply run the two mechanisms and take the better one, because it's not gonna be incentive compatible. Okay, so that's a tricky part. I'll show you one example where this actually happens. Okay, so you have to do something more careful. All right. Okay, so uh, just remind everyone the, the big picture. So the optimal mechanism, uh, quite complex, hard to design. Uh, we have worst case guarantee. We also have asymptotic optimal mechanisms. We're looking for something that lies uh, in the intersection. Okay. Okay, and for the rest of the talk, um, 20 minutes? 10. How, how long? I have 10. 12. So standard to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, for the rest of the talk, uh, so I think I can def. How long do I have? Yeah. 20. Just a factor of two approximation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so 20 is good then. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you're minimizing or maximizing, but uh, okay, yeah, fine. All right, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll show you uh, a mechanism that gives you both guarantees for double auctions. And then I'll talk about matching markets. Um, in fact, uh, McAfee's trade reduction was only defined on double auction. It was not defined on matching markets. So we have to first come up with a generalization of that mechanism for matching markets. And now I'll show you how you, how you can get uh, modify the mechanism to get both type of guarantees. Okay, double auction. Okay, so here uh, is uh, this very naive approach I was talking about. Okay, so let's try to do this. Okay, so for the reported profile BS, I'm going to first compute the Q, the efficient trade size. Okay, if Q is at least two, I'm going to run the trade reduction because already there you had have some guarantee, right? One minus one over Q. Okay. Uh, if Q is one, true reduction gives you nothing. In fact, true reduction would not even do anything. Okay. I'm gonna run this uh, 
random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism. Okay, so okay. that's what I'm going to do. All right, so let's look at one particular example. So I have, uh, let's say, only two buyers, two sellers. Okay. And now if I run this particular mechanism and say B2 has value 90, 98, Q will be 2, right? So I run trade reduction. So this edge will be reduced to trade only uh, the only two pairs are trading, uh, the only two agents are trading are B1 and S1. Okay. So that's what happens in this mechanism. Okay. Now imagine that B2 uh, is 80 instead of 98. Okay. Not only have Q equal to 1, right? Because this edge is no longer uh, an efficient trade. So Q is 1. So I'm not running a trade reduction. Uh, I'm jumping to this step. Okay, I will run this random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism. And uh, if you compute uh, the virtual values for the buyer and uh, the two buyers, you will see that uh, the only edge that can trade is actually this edge. Okay, so the virtual value of B2 is positive, uh, the virtual value of B1 is negative, so this is the only edge that can trade. <coughs> and so that means if B2 reports 80, she actually can uh, trade. So that just gives incentive for uh, the second buyer to lie. Okay. Because this allocation is just not monotone, all right? Uh, so the main issue here is when Q is one, uh, this uh, solid offering mechanism is trading a pair that's not in first best. Okay, so that uh, creates uh, this opportunity for buyer two to, uh, to lie. Okay, so uh, here's what we do to fix, fix the problem. So uh, instead of running the whole random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism, we're, just, we're gonna force uh, the mechanism to only offer trade on the first best edges. Okay. And why is that a good idea? Uh, I mean, the reason is the only way that an agent can lie and gain is uh, when this agent can line to cause a switch between Q equals two to Q equals one. Okay. But if I'm forcing you know, the mechanism to only trade on first best edges, uh, they should just try to get into the first best edges instead of try to you know, lie and go to some other possible edge. Okay, so uh, that's the rationale. And you know, a trivial way to do it is like I can run just random offering on the first best edge. Okay, so uh, it is IC mechanism now. Okay. Uh, but there is another issue. Uh, now it's not clear whether this is a good approximation. The reason being that all we know is the solid offering edge will give you a good approximation. Now you're trading on a different edge, okay? In fact, it's not even clear how often you would trade. You're just running some random offering mechanism there. The probability that the trade happens depends on the distribution. So it's not even clear how often the trade will happen. Okay, so how do we uh, deal with that? Okay, so here is an observation that was very useful for us. Uh, in fact, it's the key observation that allows us to design the mechanism. Okay, so we know the seller offering me uh, mechanisms are taking this edge, okay? So that means this edge at least has some positive gains from trade. Okay. So B2 is greater than S1, and now if you want buyer one to get into the first best, the buyer one needs to be at least as big as B2, right? Okay. And similarly, for S1 to get into this seller offering edge, uh, it better be that uh, S1 is lower than S2. Okay, so our approach is still you do random offering on the first best edge, but now I'm gonna add some restriction on the prices you can use. Okay. You're only allowed to use prices between B2 and S2. Okay. Instead of just letting you pick a whatever price that optimizes you know, uh, the buyer or seller's utility, you can only pick prices in this range. Okay, and this uh, turns out to be uh, enough to guarantee the trade happens with good probability. The reason is quite simple. 
uh, because this red edge is there, so uh, B2 is greater than S1. Uh, in fact, even the virtual value of B2 is greater than S1. So bar one, now say bar one's gonna do offering to this seller, okay? Bar one's gonna offer a price that's at least B2, right, because my restriction, okay? So if you offer B2, S1 will accept it, right, because B2 is greater than S1, okay? So I make sure whenever at least the bar, when the buyer is offering, uh, the trade happens on this edge. Okay. And okay, so here's the hybrid mechanism. So uh, I first compute the efficient trade size. If Q is at least two, I run the trade reduction. Else, I'm going to run the trade, uh, run the random offering mechanism on uh, the B1 S1 pair. And with probably one half, uh, I let the seller offer by saying, you know, you can offer a price that's not higher than S2. And also, I tell the seller that, you know, buyer one's value is at least B2, okay? So you should choose a price between B2 and S2, okay? And do something similar for the buyer, okay? So that's the mechanism. And the guarantee that we can provide is this mechanism is IR, uh, big, exposed budget balance. And it gives you one quarter of the expected gains from trade of the second best. Uh, I'll explain why this is not one half. And it gives you also this asymptotic efficiency guarantee. You get one minus one of Q. Because whenever Q is greater than two, uh, you're running a return reduction. So you get the same guarantee as the return reduction. Um, and the reason that we're not getting one half is basically because you're comparing to this random virtual welfare maximizing mechanism. And so far, we can only show that you uh, cover one half of that always. Uh, and that's a factor two approximation. So you get one quarter. Uh, but this is probably not tight. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly talk about matching markets. Uh, just to remind you, matching market, the only difference is uh, not have a bipartite graph that specifies uh, the possible trade. Okay, so uh, I think I will just uh, spend a few minutes talking uh, talk about the, the trade reduction mechanism in the matching market. Okay, so. Um, in double auction, uh, uh, we have convergence to efficiency if the market grows. Right, so now, <clears throat> how can we define this large market or you know, uh, efficient trade size in matching markets? So if you just simply add you know, more trading pairs into the graph, that's not going to help. Right? Imagine you're going to add a bunch of isolating edges. Uh, that's not going to help. Imagine you have n parallel you know, edges. That's just n you know, bilateral trade cases. And the trade reduction is not going to do anything to it. Okay? You have to be more careful about how you define uh, this efficient trade size when you actually have uh, you know, an arbitrary bipartite graph. Okay, so here's one way that we viewed a double auction and was useful for, our, uh, for us to come up with a generalization. <coughs> so the way we think about this is uh, in double auction, every seller can replace every other seller in a trade. You know, they're replaceable, right? Because everyone can trade with everybody. <laughs> and so I'm going to basically put sellers or buyers into equivalence classes based on, you know, the number, the, the set of agents they can trade with. Okay? So one thing I want to uh, uh, emphasize here is uh, I'm talking about equivalence class. I'm talking about, you know, sellers can be replaceable, but I'm not making assumptions on their distributions. This is just some property about the graph. Okay, I'm not making ID assumptions on the distribution. Okay, so, uh, so for matching market, we basically we're going to define, say, the number of trading agents of each class will grow large, and I say every two agents in the same class can trade with exactly the same set of agents. So that's how I'm gonna define the equivalence classes. Uh, here's one example. Uh, so if you're in this market, these two buyers are in one equivalence class because they can trade with exactly the same set of sellers. Uh, and you know, for all agents, you can partition them into four classes. Okay, so now for every class, I can define the, the number of trades. Okay, so here in this particular matching, uh, this class has trade size two. Okay, in double auction, you just one class for sellers, one class for buyers. Uh, and so here, every particular equivalence class has uh, this uh, uh, an associated 
trade number, uh, trade size. <clears throat> so if I say a market grows large, uh, I mean that the, the efficient trade size for every class grows large. And okay. <clears throat> so this is roughly the mechanism. So uh, take the profile, the top uh, QT minus one agents will trade. And then you know the winning agents need to pay the value for the top reduced agent. And this is the guarantee that we managed to provide. Uh, so basically you're gonna take the minimum across all the equivalence classes and you get one minus one over QT. Okay. Uh, in particular, you know, if every class has trace size at least two, you get at least two, uh, a two approximation. Uh, if there's one class that has one, only one trade, then you don't get any uh, guarantee. So that's a trade reduction mechanism. All right. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about the, the random offering mechanism. Uh, the idea is similar. You, you, you basically only do uh, the random offering on the first best edges. But now the difficulty is you're gonna come up with some prices, right? You want to come up with this restriction on the prices you can use as in double auction. Okay, what's the uh, analog of this B2 and S2 in double auctions? So it turns out uh, they coincide with VCG prices for I and J. Uh, so you can have actually a very succinct way of describing this you know, upper bound and lower bounds. Uh, I won't go into details. All right, so let me just say the main result. So we show that, <coughs> so I'm gonna use alpha to denote the minimum value between this one minus one over Q quantity. And the mechanism is basically whenever alpha is at least one half, you run the trade reduction. Otherwise, run this random offering mechanism. And uh, again, you have the same guarantee as in double auction. You get one quarter of uh, the second best in the worst case. Uh, and you get this alpha uh, fraction of the opt. And this alpha goes to uh, one if uh, the, the market size grows. For double auction, you have to restrict the random offering to the first best edges, right? Right, so I'm doing is two. So here you find the first best matching. I'm now for every edge in that matching, I'm running some random offering. Okay, only for the matching in the first best. Only yes, the only the edges in the first best. I'm doing a random offering on every edge. And on every edge, I'm computing an upper bound and lower bound on the prices you can use. And those prices uh, depend on VCG prices in some settings. Okay. So yeah, so one nice thing I want to point out is you know you get a mechanism that's also exposed budget balance, exposed IR. So if you want interim IR exposed budget balance, or you know the other way, that's quite easy. But if you're going to get exposed guarantees in both cases, uh, uh, this is actually the first I know that I give you this. Okay. No proof sketch. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let me just quickly conclude. Uh, so this uh, mechanism is, uh, achieves both types of guarantee. Uh, and uh, again, I would like to think about this as a mechanism that gives you some guarantee on the hard instances and very good performance on the easy instances. Um, so this is easy to do for algorithms, but quite difficult for mechanism because incentives. And you know, I think it's interesting to try to find more mechanisms of this sort that, uh, that can achieve both, uh, best of both worlds. Right. About time, right? You finished early. Oh, <laughs> maybe I can go back to the proof. Oh, but. <laughs> you can. Really? OK, I can say a few words about the, the, the upper and lower bound. Um, okay, so the mechanism is uh, you find the first best matching. On every edge in that matching, I'm gonna do some random offering mechanism, uh, but I'm gonna ask some restriction on the prices you can use. Okay. Here's how I'm gonna compute the uh, restriction, okay? So for every edge ij in the first best matching, uh, I have a s bar, which is the minimum bid for buyer i if buyer i lower, if, if buyer i has anything higher than s bar, i will still be in the first best, even if j is not there. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the threshold bit for bar i to get into the first pass if j is not there. Okay, so this is VCG price for i if j is not there. Uh, let's think about what this means in the double auction case. Okay, in the double auction case, you have buyer one and seller one matching. Okay, so now I'm going to compute the S bar. Okay, so that will be the minimum value for buyer one to get into first best when S one is not there. Okay, so that's S two exactly. You have to be uh, be higher than S two to get in there. Okay, and B bar uh, is the maximum bit for seller J, such that if J reports anything lower, then J will make it to the first pass, even if I is not there. Okay. In double auction case, this will be B2. Okay. So that's how we uh, define the upper and lower bound on the prices you can use. And then it's just like take for every edge, compute these two quantities, run the random offering in this range. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I, don't, I won't be able to say more about why these are the, the good things. Uh, Yeah, so basically the argument in the end is, you know, uh, you, you're going to cover, you try to use the first best matching to cover uh, the seller offering uh, mechanism. So the ed red edges are the ones in the seller offering mechanism. The green ones are, are in the first best. And you have a bunch of possible, you know, uh, alternating cycles and paths. And you can show basically a large chunk of them are impossible. So these are impossible because you're looking at first best. For example, this one is impossible because uh, if the seller offering can match these three edges, first best should take these three edges as well. Okay, so there are things you can just rule out uh, by definition. Okay. These are the only two cases you need to deal with. Uh, either you have even pass when both endpoints are buyers, or you have some all pass. Okay. And turns out this, uh, these two you can cover uh, using the, the random offering mechanism because uh, the upper and lower bounds make sure that in these alternating paths, uh, every edge will trade with probably at least one half. Okay, so that's roughly what happens in the end. Okay. thing would be to say that as I grow the graph, if the number of perfect matchings grows larger, that should be... The maximum matching, you mean? Number of maximum matchings. No, but like you can add isolate the edges. No, but if you have an isolated edge... So that's I mean, the matching size still grows, uh, but those are not going to help. Distinct perfect matching, sorry. So if I had a maximum degree requirement, for example, then like coding students would say I have a minimum degree. Yeah, so, uh, okay, um, so I agree there might be other reasonable, you know, large market assumptions there. Uh, I think one nice thing about this result is, I mean, it's, we, we didn't prove it as a theorem, but if you have a reasonable large market assumption and the trade reduction there, you can just plug in our random offering mechanism in the second phase to do it. We're not using too much properties about, you know, uh, how you do trade reduction. We're only using the fact that you're actually trading on the first best edges. And when you do trade reduction, that's basically what you do. So you can prove some sort of more modular result. Uh, we didn't say the result in that way. But I think if you have other types of large market assumptions, you can basically take the second part and you know, still get the mechanism. Thanks, Ian.